where you've got the dun 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 bum 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 and the choir are going ah, ha, ha. <laughs> hello and welcome to the music professor channel i'm matthew king today we're doing something rather different we're going to look at the classic fm hall of fame 2023 which is a slightly curious thing that classic fm do where they rank lots of classical pieces as if there were a kind of popular chart of, of stuff. And I, I think it's based on, on viewers voting, but it's a funny old thing and it, it sort of sits there gradually gathering votes, I suppose. But I just want to have a look at it today and see what's on the roster. So, top 50. Sorry? Top 50. Oh yeah, so today we're just going to look at the top 50, working down from 50, and I see that number 50 is Piano Concerto number three by Rachmaninoff. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, one of the great tunes, isn't it? Uh, Rachmaninoff's Piano Concerto No. 3, why is it at 50? It seems a rather better piece than that. And I happen to know that the second Piano Concerto is substantially higher up the list, but I would say of the two, is three the better work? I, I mean, it's certainly a more ambitious piece. Anyway, that's number 50. Uh, Rimsky Korsakov's Scheherazade. Well, of course, that's. Um, and uh, everyone loves that piece. 49, I don't know. I guess it's the sort of piece that people like listening to. And indeed, for good reason. It's a lovely piece. Perhaps of its era. Uh, Harry Potter, The Philosopher's Stone. Um, well, I mean, I know it's got this. Uh, it's got this famous. Oh! Try to drop there, yeah. Uh, John Williams on top form, I suppose, with certainly that tune, and it's not a bad score. 48. Jurassic Park. Well, you can't go wrong with Jurassic Park. Dinosaurs, uh, terrific trumpet melody, which I'm not going to attempt to play. Uh, Spartacus. Uh, it's this, isn't it? Used to be the uh, it used to be the theme tune for a program in the 70s, and I think this is still the reason why it's really famous is that it used to be the melody for the Onegin line. Is can that really be the right reason why it's still popular? My viewers will tell me. It's very beautiful. I mean, it's a beautiful post Tchaikovskyan melody in the Russian tradition. Kachaturian was an Armenian composer. I lost the Kachaturian's music actually. He's a he's a wonderful. Soviet composer, sort of sub Shostakovich. Um, Einaudi comes in at 45. I won't lie to you, I'm no fan of Einaudi. I appreciate the fact that he was a student of Luciano Berio, who I do rather admire, but they, there the comparison really ends. Einaudi's music is sort of like soft vocal minimalism, and it's certainly individual. I'm not disparaging people who like his music. I can see why it's effective, but uh, it's not my favorite. Oh, the Moonlight Sonata. Well, we've done some programs about that on this channel. That comes in at 44. Uh, 43, we've got the Hall of the Mountain King. Uh, uh, I'm not playing it very well, but there is Peer Gint, Suite Number 2. Well, you know, it's got lots going for it. What a terrific crescendo Grieg created in that piece. And it's like the godfather of all subsequent sort of rhythmic, slightly scary pieces, isn't it? I can see why it's popular. Gladiator. Uh, do you know, we were watching this movie the other day on TV. And... Um... Oh, is that it? I don't think that's it. Uh, Gladiator. Hang on. Let me try and remember how it does go. It's got this lady going, ah, at the beginning. <laughs> it's somebody in a recording studio just putting on a voice, but it sort of has a kind of poetry, doesn't it? Especially when you watch the film and you see Russell Crowe, well, it's probably not Russell Crowe's fingers, but some fingers running through the corn and, and all, all, all of that. <laughs> and it creates an evocative image in the movie. Gladiator is a curious score. Bits of it seem awfully like the music to Pirates of the Caribbean, also by Hans Zimmer, and I find that juxtaposition of those styles a little bit wearing. When you watch the movie now, it seems a bit strange. <laughs> Uh, 
But, you know, it's a classic movie and its fame is deserved. Rhapsody on a Theme of Paganini by Rachmaninoff. Uh, what is there to say? I love that piece. It's an astonishing masterpiece. Probably deserves to be higher up the list than 41. I'm not going to attempt to play it here. The Messiah at 40. Do you know, I'm a big Handel fan and I've been listening to quite a few of his oratorios live recently. Uh, I've had the good luck to hear the Monteverdi choir singing them. Um, my goodness, they're amazing. I think Messiah is possibly one of the least good <laughs> of Handel's oratorios. That's a very personal opinion. And it's not to say that Messiah isn't amazing and it's full of very, very famous songs. But I don't find it the most exciting of Handel's oratorios. That's just uh, me letting you know that there are other oratorios out there that are equally good or better by Handel. Well, I mean, he's an amazing composer. Packelbell's Canon in D major. Well, uh, you've got the famous sort of um, very, very simple circle of fifths sort of progression. And then, of course, the canon, which is to say that the melody is then replicated by a second violin and then another violin and so on. Do I like it? I suppose it's, it's beautiful. Uh, it's very much of its era. Why is it so popular? I guess it's, it's soothing and serene. Uh, I have a suspicion that Packelbell wrote some more interesting pieces than the canon. Dare I say that on camera? I think he probably did. It was Packelbell that the young J.S. Bach admired a great deal. He was one of the composers of the previous generation that Bach admired. The canon is fine, but there are other pieces. Jazz Suite number no. two by Shostakovich. Let's have a listen to it. Oh yes. yes. I didn't say that, something like that. Uh, it's, uh, it's Shostakovich. It's Shostakovich in his popular style. It's great. It's individual, slightly Soviet. It's sort of picking up on the Tchaikovsky inheritance, but in a more Soviet realist way. And it's got a lot of charisma and that's why it's popular. Is it jazz? Oh, no, it isn't really, is it? Why did he call it Jazz Suite? It doesn't sound like jazz at all to me. But to him, perhaps it did. Perhaps he thought he was being terribly trendy. It's got some saxophones in it. Um, Mahler's Adagietto, 37, uh, written for his wife, Alma, I believe, as a sort of love offering. Let's see if I can do it. Harps. It's got that kind of chord, hasn't it? F major. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm remembering the, the second phrase. Da, 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 da. This, um, uh, you know, everyone loves it. It's associated with Visconti's death in Venice, isn't it? And everyone who hears it realizes that Mahler's a great composer. I guess that's what happens when you hear that piece. Death in Venice, not my favourite film, uh, but the music is beautiful because it's Mahler. Prominently used in the Bernstein film recently, Maestro. Um, great piece, harp and strings, one of the best for that combination of instruments. Five variants of Dives and Lazarus. I remember being played this by my old friend Tony Payne, who completed Elgar's Third Symphony, and he was an admirer. I have to admit, I can't really remember how it goes. It doesn't appear to be. It doesn't appear to be either. I remember it's very lovely and it's somewhat in the vein of Lark Ascending, but actually slightly better, dare I say it, than Lark Ascending. It's a lovely piece for strings. There's a folk song in the middle of it, which I can't quite remember. Goodness, someone's going to have to remind me. Five variants of Dives and Lazarus. It's beautiful. Interesting that it's at 36. In other words, above Mahler's Adagietta. It's very surprising. Above... Uh, the Rhapsody on a Theme of Paganini by Rachmaninoff, really? Okay, well, we all love Vaughan Williams. I'm not complaining. It's just an intriguing position. The Lord of the Rings coming in at 35. Well, who doesn't love the score to the uh, Lord of the Rings? Uh, uh, I remember. I'm, I'm getting the chords wrong, but that's, that's a theme. My favourite tune in that score is that weird one where there's a moth that's coming out of Gandalf's mouth or something. <laughs> uh, uh, how does that go? It's sort of, ooh, but a uh, moth, Gandalf, 
Moth. Gandalf. Gandalf. So this is the tune that goes, um, uh, do you remember this? Uh, da, that thing. Uh, da, 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 da. I think it goes major or something. And then there's a sort of shift. Anyway, it's, it's beautiful. I always think the, these little sort of ethereal bits in the score are my favourite bits, slightly mysterious, almost like Benjamin Britten. Uh, the Asher kind of Farewell by Jay Ungar with the Stars and Stripes image there. No idea what that is. Uh, let's move on from that. Someone else, one of you guys out there can tell me what that is. Swan Lake of Tchaikovsky. Who doesn't love that? Uh, shall I play something from Swan Lake? Oh! <laughs> uh, yes. Uh. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, is that the right key as well? Is it that? A German sick? Sometimes when you're improvising famous classical pieces that you haven't ever played before, you can fall foul of these interesting shifts of harmony. Tchaikovsky, what a great harmonist he is. Right, Star Wars, including The Force Awakens, Empire Strikes Back, Phantom Menace, so everything there. Well, Star Wars is, of course, a, a classic John Williams score. I, I'm wondering if my favourite bit in the whole Star Wars cycle is that marvellous scene where, in The Phantom Menace, where you've got the dun 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 bum 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 and the choir are going, ah, ha ha! It's really full on. It's sort of this Verdian craziness and of course very exciting visuals because you've got that big fight with Darth Maul. I like that. <laughs> um, I realise that Phantom Menace is not considered one of the great movies in the set but I think John Williams did very well with that. Symphony Number no. 3 by Saint-Saëns, the organ symphony which is very famous from uh, the movie Babe, of course, because it's got that. <laughs> that sort of chorale thing at the end with the organ. Yeah, Saint Saint. Well, he was good at that sort of thing. He's not my favourite composer, I'll be honest. And the organ symphony, I much prefer um, Carnival of the An Animals. That's really good, Saint Saint. The organ symphony, which well, seems a bit overblown to me, but I'll. Except that it's there. Cavaliera Rusticana, I mean, obviously one of the great uh, popular Italian operas. I can fully understand why that's there. Oh, and we got Rack 2 coming in at 29. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, it's wonderful. Uh, but what's that wonderful tune? Da -da. in the second movement. Who else would dare to do such a thing? So just use a sequential progression like that. And I love the um, da 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 the, the sort of binding fate theme of the second symphony. I will, I will say something controversial now for my composer colleagues and young composers for whom it's always been fashionable, I suppose, to sort of denigrate Rachmaninoff. My personal view is he's an unfathomable genius. I mean, what an amazing composer. He can write a tune, but he also could write the most intricate counterpoint, the, the richest, most varied textures. He can do anything. I love Rachmaninoff. Uh, okay, uh, Claire de Lune comes in at 29. It says Sweet Bergamask, but no one listens to the Sweet Bergamask. Uh, everyone listens to the third movement. Uh, with its lovely, sweet, moon-drenched thirds. I think we might do a video about Claire de Lune sometime. Not my favourite piece of Debussy, though. It's, it's nice. It's a lovely late 19th century salon piece. Of course, because it's by Debussy, it's very, very beautiful. But he wrote better pieces. 